Um, so I'm, and he has done most of the work that I'm going to talk about today. So what am I going to talk about? Let me give a, first a little bit of motivation and introduction to Axion Dark Matter. And then uh, most of my talk will be consequences for direct detection experiments. And then I'm going to go into crazy land and talk about uh, Bose condensates uh, uh, and many body uh, quantum mechanics. So a little motivation. Uh, right? Dark matter. It's 80-odd percent of the uh, matter in the universe, and we don't know what it is other than it's not baryons. Uh, one of the remarkable results in the early 80s from numerical simulations, this was before we detected the CDM uh, perturbations, was that the dark matter was not the light neutrinos. Um, and so we have this prospect that we can use numerical simulations to put further constraints on what the, what the dark matter is. And here's a few of the possible candidates you know, probably the one that most people talk about these days is the, uh, is the WIMP. But I should point out that in the early 80s, the axion was kind of one of the first particles that was uh, mentioned in reviews of possible candidates for the, uh, for the dark matter. So just to get everybody on the same page as what an axion is uh, in, in terms of uh, mass scale, all right, so we have the WIMP, which people know about. Uh, it's formed thermally, but because of its large mass, it has a very small velocity dispersion, and we call it cold. The QCD axion and the ultralight axions are significantly less massive, <coughs> microEV to MeV for a QCD axion, uh, but they're not formed thermally. And so they are also cold for a very different reason, and indeed very cold. And then I won't be talking uh, uh, about the ultralights, but I think we're going to have another talk in this session about them. And, and here we're at the mass scale with, where the de Broglie wavelength is of astronomical interest. So just to remind you what the QCD axion is. So it, it's particularly compelling because it's one of these two birds, one stone type of, uh, of, uh, of arguments. Uh, so there's this other problem besides the dark matter problem. All right, thank you, Joel. Uh, and that is the strong CP problem. So uh, the... the Classic example is, why doesn't the neutron, which is composed of three charged quarks, have an electric dipole moment? So the, uh, and indeed, the strong force has this non-CP, that's charge parity conserving term. What is causing the parameter in front of that term to be nearly zero? Uh, Petchy and Quinn, that's Helen Quinn. Isn't it your, <laughs> your supervisor? Uh, all right, so your colleague, Helen, Helen Quinn. And, and co-author of many papers. Yes, you worked with. Uh, proposed that there was this field that enforced this symmetry dynamically, and so the quantization of that field is called uh, the axion. And it turns out that with the appropriate range of mass and coupling to, uh, to photons, that this axion could also be the cosmological dark matter. So th this is wonderful. One particle, we solve two problems. Uh, furthermore, it is weakly coupled to, uh, to photons, and so it's detectable in what's called a haloscope, uh, which is essentially a microwave cavity that's embedded in a, a strong magnetic field. It's cold because it forms in a Bose condensate, during a phase transition in the early universe, but its de Broglie wavelength is of order AU, so not really detectable on cosmological uh, uh, scales. And so when we model it, we're just going to model it as a classic uh, cold dark matter. Just use the collisionless Boltzmann equation uh, to model it. So let me tell you about how the detector works. Okay, so there's 
basically a two-photon interaction. Uh, and the, one of the photons is provided by a several Tesla uh, magnetic field. Inside that magnetic field is a very cold uh, microwave detector and a microwave cavity. And so the, uh, you detect that gamma going out is a microwave photon, which you can measure with a very uh, sensitive amplifier. Uh, the cavity is very high Q, so that uh, if you detect uh, uh, an axion, it will pr produce a very narrow sig uh, signal. So here's power. Uh, you might not be able to. So the, uh, the range here is at 600 uh, megahertz, a range of about 30 uh, hertz or so, or sorry, 30 kilohertz. So uh, very narrow uh, um, uh, line widths. And so this then motivates having very high quality uh, models of the, of the uh, galaxy halo because you can map out the energy distribution of the dark matter uh, very, very accurately if it is axion. So, so by good models, uh, I, I do mean uh, models that include baryons. And so, so the first thing uh, I should point out that um, uh, Risa Wexler back in the late 90s pointed out that sort of an isothermal sphere is not a very good halo model to compare against that uh, dark matter produces, doesn't produce an isothermal sphere. Uh, what I want to show you now is work by uh, Allison Brooks and her student. And just pay attention to the red line in this column, which is dark matter only velocity distribution, versus the blue line in this column, which is, again, it's the distribution of, of dark matter velocity distribution, but in a simulation that also includes baryons. And we can see that the shapes are indeed different. And it, what you naively expect is maybe the baryons would be more, con uh, would concentrate the dark matter velocity distribution. But that's not the case. Uh, baryons actually make the velocity distribution broader um, for reasons I don't uh, fully understand. Uh, so what I decided to do, or Eric decided to do is based on the work that Allison did, did we actually have a whole sample of Milky Way like galaxies. This is the Romulus simulation uh, that uh, Michael Tremel helped me work on. And we have, this is a 25 megaparsec volume. We have of order a dozen Milky Way type galaxies. We pick those up out and look at their dark matter velocity distribution. And this is you know, what we get. So this is now we're measuring the velocity distribution or the energy distribution of the dark matter in Milky Way halos extracted from this uh, Romulus simulation in the frame of a solar orbit. Okay, so we're sitting on uh, a circular orbit, eight kiloparsecs from the center of the galaxy. And you notice that you have a significantly narrower uh, even with the baryons, the, the energy distribution is significantly narrower than so the standard halo model that is typically used in dark matter direct detection experiments. And notice that uh, the scale on the bottom here is frequency. So, you know, what frequency will we detect the axion uh, in, in our microwave uh, cavity? Is that going to put in a small sphere around the sun? Or... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, basically, that actually the average of a, of the solar orbit. Yeah. Yes, Cindy. Are you assuming some basic mass for the axion? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So the the mass for the axion comes out here. And that's assumed. Uh, yeah. And and changing the mass of the axion would just shift. Would just change this so number. Study. Yeah. I, that is. The mass of the axion would determine sort of what frequency range you would look at. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Sandy. 
Uh, right, so, um, so this model has actually been used uh, on the ADMX experiment. So this is an experiment at the University of Washington uh, where they're scanning uh, for, uh, looking for the, uh, uh, for the axion. Uh, up above, so this inset shows you the typical range that, of axion masses in micro EVs that people are looking at. The vertical scale is constraints on the coupling constant to photons. Uh, and the light shades are previous experiments. And so this is a recent run, the dark blue here, uh, of the ADMX experiment and using our M-body model for the uh, distribution of the dark matter. And then the dashed lines are two minimal models of the, of the coupling constants. Basically, it, it, does the axon couple through hadrons or does it couple through hadrons and leptons? And so this is quite remarkable that we are actually getting down to where we can rule out a particular range in axion mass at around 2.75 micro EV. This experiment will continue to run. It's essentially, it's a high Q experiment, so you can only want, look at very small ranges of frequency and you have to scan over time. So it'll take several years to cover that light blue area all the way down to, the, uh, to our limit. So that's wonderful. We're, we're actually constraining, uh, ruling out uh, particular axion masses. Okay, now we're off to uh, crazy land. Um, so, I pointed out, the, way, the De Broglie wavelength of these QCD axions are small. And, and furthermore, even though they're essentially quantum mechanical objects, you know, Bose condensate, we expect things to essentially look classical. That is this gross pietrzewski equation. Quantum mechanical equation, it becomes, looks like the classical um, uh, equations of motions on large scales, but you know, I mean, this is just a, a, a anecdotal justification, right? The phenomenon of Bose condensate states is much larger than the de Broglie scale. For example, the the superconducting magnet in which the ADMX experiment sits is much larger than the de Broglie wavelength of the Cooper pairs. Right. So, unfortunately, describing this kind of phenomenon is difficult. So, just a little justification of, of where I'm going. So, first let's look at this in a, in a classical sense. We, we think of a collection of dark matter as each of the individual particles are gravitationally interacting with all the other particles in, in, the, in the halo. We're pretty convinced that we can uh, accurately describe that with the collision of Boltzmann equation where each uh, particle is just interacting with the mean field, mean gravitational field of every other uh, particle. Okay? And mean field theory is also used in quantum mechanics. That's what the Gross-Pietewski equation is about. And again, we, now these particles are described by wave functions but the potential that they experience is just the mean of all the other particles. But going back to this picture, all right, yes, we have the gravitational interaction, but there is also the constraints of symmetry. These are bosons, and so there's a, there's a potential associated with the fact that, that uh, the wave function of this particle and that particle has to be symmetrized. And so how do you take that into account? So, um, <clears throat> so uh, Eric has worked on this. It's, uh, it's not easy. Um, how am I doing for time here? Oh, okay, plenty of time. Not early. Um, so basically what we do is right, for this kind of system, we actually write the Hamiltonian as a function of the intraparticle distances. And this sounds crazy at first. You're changing a 3n 
dimensional problem into a 3n squared dimensional problem. Uh, but by doing that, you can explicitly uh, symmetrize uh, the wave functions. And, and then, right, there's this transformation that takes you from wave function to distribution function. And going through, through the math, you get down to what looks like a, here's a collisionless Boltzmann equation here, but you have this extra term that actually kind of looks like a collision term. You're integrating over a second uh, particle. And then the term in the, uh, the term in the brackets there is essentially a two-point correlation function. And the strength of which depends on how correlated uh, your initial conditions are. That is how, how, how well into the condensate you are. So we, so we have what we believe is a, is a valid equation for a condensate that has long-term interactions. What is the effect on at least some simple systems? Uh, here's a toy model. We're just looking at the collapse of a spherical shell. And it turns out that the exchange correlation uh, right, for fermions, exchange correlation gives you this repulsive force. For bosons, it, it gives you this attractive force. The attractive force actually goes as r to the quarter. And if we compare, uh, so the lambda plus is telling you how correlated things are. So if you're uncorrelated, you have the classical result in the yellow. Uh, but as things become more and more uh, correlated, the, the last stages of the collapse happen ever more quickly because of the exchange correlation. We are starting, or Eric is starting to right, encode that into a, right now, simple n-body pro, uh, program to calculate the collapse of a actual uh, more cosmological-like uh, collapse. And so here's just scale density versus radius profile. Uh, if you look at the um, solid lines, say the solid orange line would be your standard cold dark matter, no quantum effects, and you get the, the NFW profile. As things become more co uh, correlated, the very correlated is the dotted lines in that figure. And there you're seeing that you're actually changing the inner profile um, of, of the collapsed object. Again, the details were still working out. <clears throat> so just in, uh, this is all preliminary work, but just to, to summarize what, what we're talking about here, right? The axions are very compelling dark matter, and it because of this sort of two birds, uh, 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 phenomenon. Uh, and we do have direct detection experiments that can map out uh, the uh, constraints on the uh, axion density. Uh, for those experiments, you do need very good halo models because the, essentially what you're doing is a, a good halo model is increasing the effective signal to noise of the experiment. Um, and my definition of good, again, it means you have to include the baryonic physics. And then in the last part of my talk, uh, it is possible that uh, if the axions are this Bose-Einstein condensate, there is non-classical behavior due to correlations on, uh, and uh, long-range forces, that is long-range above the Borelli scale, Although, this is a really hard problem. Anybody who's done planetary equations of state knows that many body quantum mechanics is not easy. But I'm arguing that you know, the compelling nature of the dark matter problem makes it worthwhile thinking, you know, digging into those quantum mechanics books and doing a little hard work. So thank you.
Yeah. Did you say something about where, what would influence the amount of correlation? So uh, the fraction of the axions in the ground state. So how much of a condensate? How, how condensed? OK, go further and tell yeah. us what influences that. Oh, uh, that has to do with the physics of the phase transition. So the axions are produced. Really? Right. Yeah. Can you say more? Um, <laughs> can I say more? Probably there might be other people in the audience that know more about this. Basically, um, that's about it. Uh, basically, a change in the shape of the, you know, it's this typical Mexican hat potential that uh, symmetry gets broken and how that, you know, the time scale in which that gets broken determines how Right, so uh, you know, axions are oscillations in the in the uh, axial direction in this Mexican hat potential. Uh, yeah, I know that's not a complete answer, but that's the extent of my knowledge. We'll do for now. Okay. I have a really quick question. So, um, for the first part, when you're looking at these orbits sweeping out. Um, how does that vary over the course of the orbit? So your signal is this average signal. Does, do, is it possible that you know from I don't know orbit to orbit or year to year, do you, do you expect that that to matter at all? Or in in the simulations, was it smooth enough that it didn't matter? I, I, phew, I didn't. I mean, I think the galaxy to galaxy variation is probably so larger than yeah, yeah, yeah. Than, than a, a variation within a single galaxy. Um, one, uh, let me do one more. So, similar question about the halo dark matter model. So, of course, the resolution we have in the current simulation is terrible, right? Maybe a thousand or so in mass, it's sort of macro mm. particles. Mm -hmm. we, we worry about small scale fine grain energy or velocity. I'm sure you can correct me if I get it wrong. No, I do worry about that. So, uh, all right, so uh, there are people working in the axiom dark matter detection game who worry about things like caustics. All right, so that, that would be another quantum mechanical phenomenon. Um, and we, we're nowhere near, in my opinion, the resolution to really get at those caustics. Okay, thanks very much. Great. Okay, now we have Omid Sami, who's going to talk about.